Okay, I'm going to now get into the subject in slightly more detail. And there's a reason for this. You know, you, you've heard from us on the India story. So many reforms have been done. So many positive things have been done. But fixing the judicial system to some extent, speeding it up, reducing pendency, perhaps the single most important item on the reform agenda. And that's why on the Indians, India story, we're going to keep coming back to this theme. Two really special experts now joining us to shed light on what has happened this week and what perhaps still can be done next phase. It's an ongoing process. Um, Mr. Emma Madhavan joining us, uh, you know, president of PRS, doing a lot of work on all legislation and how it pans out. Pinky Anand, of course, senior advocate, former, uh, you know, uh, uh, Solicitor General of India. So thank you both so much for being with us to shed some light on it. Mr. Madhavan, why don't I start with you? When you take a look at the Sanhitas as have been, you know, again reintroduced, presumably, if the din quietens down, may well be passed fairly soon. So we're going to have a completely new set of criminal laws in this country now, which is interesting because all of us have been complaining for 20 years that existing criminal laws are bad. So the new laws, better, worse than the old ones, and still changes that need to be made? Uh, yes, in a way, to the changes to be made for the simple reason that we are saying there's a complete new set of laws, but if you look at them, and for good reason, 90% of it is the same across the three. Some And some of which ought to not change too much. For example, the Evidence Act is by and large, uh, the only changes were for the electronic evidence and how to handle that. And most of it has been working well. So that's fine. But I would say, especially in terms of the new IPC, which is the BNS, uh, a number of things are still using the same philosophy, which was in the 1860 Act, which had a particular way of looking at criminal law, which I would say is more a retributive or a penal law rather than a reformative law, and which included a number of things which today you would say are civil cases. But they were, just to give you a quick context, which when I was doing research, I found it interesting that the British made the law and England itself, they had death sentence for pickpocketing until 1808. They had death sentence for theft until 1832. So it's in that context that those laws were made. They're not 21st century norms. And of course we have changed a number of them, but it still remains primarily punitive, though they have included the concept of community service without defining or explaining what that is. All right. Pinky, that point about making it more reformative rather than punitive, don't put everything which could be civil into criminal, is obviously of direct relevance because there's this other statistic. I'm going to put it up on the screen right now. That just the sheer number of people who are actually crowding Indian jails, right? And 90%, 80% in some cases are under trials. Our jails are packed with people who don't necessarily need to be there. Some of those could have been civil matters. Some of those are, are, are cases which may not be really requiring uh, jailing. And then you have the question of jail not paid. What do you make when you look at these new bills in that context? And that's an interesting phenomenon. I and mean, what uh, Mr. Madhavan just spoke about uh, reformation and retribution as two theories. I mean, criminal law has that theory across board. Uh, and also your statement about, you know, the jails being crowded and the kind of number of cases. But ultimately, let's understand what criminal law is about. So criminal law in principle, in jurisprudentially, is meant to be something which, set downs, uh, which sets down a standard for people to follow. And, in the, and on failure to do so, action is taken. And increasingly, in fact, I'll support what Mr. Madhavan is saying to some extent. For example, in Companies Act, a number of provisions of penal provisions which were made for jail were ultimately amended on to being punitive as in monetary punitive uh, nature. But reformation is a good theory principally and something which should be followed. But at the same time, what we do need to act, and in particular, if you see some of the kind of offenses, let's say terrorism. I'm just taking that as, as, as a starter. Now you have economic offenses, you have terrorism. You do have to deal with them with a stern hand. And unfortunately, until you set down that standard, it doesn't seem to work. So the principle is not that you reach towards penalty or uh, retribution only. The idea is to lay down the standard, whoever violates it, what action. I'll give you an example. For example, of cars, uh, speeding, uh, chalans, as simple as that. 
I mean, until you put down a, a file which is somewhat prohibitive, at least. I mean, even now, frankly, it isn't prohibitive. But it has gone up to a larger extent. I was party to those. The toll tax violation. You don't do that, people are not likely to follow. Unfortunately, we seem to still follow a principle that we have to be made to follow the law. Not that because there is a law, we will follow it. So, Mr. Madhavan, changes that you might... I mean, the, presumably this is an ongoing process, right? I mean, the standing committee, as you were just hearing, has come and made some suggestions and these new bills are out there. Presumably, it's going to be an ongoing process. What would you do, therefore, as Pinky very correctly said, sometimes you need a danda, because if you don't have a danda, people are not going to follow the law, right? So how do you match the necessity to have a danda, which makes people follow the laws, with some of those other things, don't overcrowd jails, principles of liberty, bail, not jail, you know, other sort of things. So those are the liberty aspects of this entire question as compared to make people behave aspect of it. What changes would you still make, if any? Some of the things which have been brought in, I'll just give you one example. So uh, there was an amendment about, I think, 2006 or so, uh, which said that if anyone has, in under trial, has served half the sentence, maximum sentence for that, would get bail. I mean, more or less like a default bail, though the public prosecutor could object, etc. Now they've added a proviso to that. They've done two things. One, they have said that if it's a first-time offender, then one-third, not half. You can let that, uh, that person shall get. But they have added that if the person is charged under more than one offense, then this is not available. Now, we all know that everyone is, I mean, for anything you do significant, the charge sheet does mention more than one thing. So, which effectively reduces the chance of people getting bail. So, why are we not actually making it easier? And of course, we are not talking about, I would say terrorism is an extreme case. I mean, not, we can't be thinking of criminal law. Although, having said that, you know, part of the problem with laws like you and others is that the charge of terrorism, that, that's the charge creep that people talk about. You yeah. put terrorism into every second FIR, I mean, not every second, but you know, you, you use terrorism sometimes when it is not really warranted to be to, to have terrorism. Same is true with the charges that are put into the charge sheet. Sometimes excessive charges are put in to deny bail and to keep people in prison when that is not really warranted. And, and you must be experiencing this also. Mr. Madhavan? Oh, uh, yeah, so frankly, I am not a, I don't practice law, so I don't, I'm talking more in conceptual terms. Yeah. So if you're trying, if your attempt is to say by saying somebody will get bail if they have served half the maximum sentence, then why do you have a proviso which essentially negates the main item, which means that people will not actually get because it's almost certain that in most cases they'll be under more than one. So either you say they won't get. Okay. Or you say Let me they ask. Won't get. Fine, fair enough. Actually, let me throw that point to Pinky because as additional solicitor general not that long ago, it was her yeah. job to actually send people to prison and make sure they stay there for a while. Pinky, the entire concept of bail, not jail, this is obvious. Every, you know, I've been hearing this debate ever since I started my journalism career 30 years now. Bail, do we need a separate bail law? Do you need to have some of the provisions that Mr. Madhavan was talking about to make it, you know, easier for first-time offenders and others? And how do you prevent the problem of charge sheet creep where people are being charged with UAPA where maybe it doesn't really warrant a terrorism uh, you know, charge in there. Or that when the FIR you suddenly put 10 charges of whom two may be warranted but the other eight are just there to make sure that the person doesn't get bail. Uh, see, I wish uh, there was an absolutely easy solution but let me try to just handle this from a couple of levels. So as a practicing lawyer and having seen a few of these things, I do think that the current amendments that are proposed, or rather the current provisions in the bill, which provide for bail on uh, having a certain amount of trial time uh, there, or under trial time, is still very significant. You may have multiple charges, but you do get the benefit. And frankly, we can't always negate charges by saying they are excessive charges. If a person has committed a crime which comes under five offenses, so be it. But you are providing for the higher, and this is very typical. In fact, there is also a question of concurrent sentences and all which we have simplified in the current provisions to allow uh, people to get released. The whole idea being that don't put people behind bars forever. So therefore, simplify that process. 
as far as the charges and all are concerned, and I do think we need another provision. See, while you were talking, there are certain acts which are, of course, non bailable. The provisions are non bailable. So, invariably, they come in and people tend to use them. Unfortunately for us, again, systematically, people who want to violate the law utilize the provisions of law. And, and therefore, sometimes uh, provisions are put in or allegations are made ultimately under an act which is non bailable. So, I think there the role of courts has to come in. Look, we know what the problem is. And it's it's one of the biggest issues in India. The, the fact that the judicial process is as protracted as it is, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years, you know, it, it's like, this is really going to be a bottleneck if India is going to become one of the fastest growing economies in the world, third largest economy. You can't have the judicial system working like this. So are there legal changes that you would make? So one is to say, okay, the court should work faster and could have more judges and the rest of it. But when it comes to the laws, could something be done in the laws themselves to make them more amenable to speedier justice? So I would actually, again, come back to it. We should have clarity firstly on deciding what can be civil cases with even monetary penalties and what can be criminal. So that takes away a lot of your case load, which where the civil cases pretend to be criminal and come into the system. That's one. Second is, there is this confusion about who can, I mean, I, I, not confusion in the terms of, the law is clear about it. I think conceptual confusion on compounding. So there is a number of offenses where, let's say, I am the victim, I have the right to compound. For example, cheating. If I have made a complaint on cheating, I'm the victim, I can compound. Now, if I go back to say that, when do we say it's a criminal? Criminal offense is when it's against society at large, public at large. Okay, it's not against a single person, it's not a personal grouse. Okay. And that's why this public system takes over and the public prosecutor comes into the picture. Now, if as a person, as a private individual, I have the power to say maaf kar do, then it, should it be considered as, should I be given the power to actually say on a, uh, if it's an offense against society to actually say chodo. Last thought on that and speeding it. So in addition to changing the laws, I wonder if there can be laws or actually principles laid down for how the courts actually are operating this concept of adjournments, tariq pe tariq, you know, stretching things on for years. Because let's face it, the delays and a delayed justice is the actual opposite of what justice should happen. Because if you delay something for seven, eight years, if you're an innocent person, it's hurting you because you're languishing in jail, whereas the trial is continuing. And if you're a guilty person, you're benefiting because you're saying by the time somebody catches up, the law catches up with me, witnesses will go, evidence will be buried. No, you're right. So I, I think one of the primary things, that in addition to what Mr. Madhavan and you were saying about, for example, appointment of more judges, filling up of vacancies, which is, of course, a peremptory thing that we do need to. And frankly, recently we've been doing a decent job of uh, filling up the appointments as and when they happen, which is something uh, quite speedy in comparison to earlier times. However, uh, what I do think is important is we must set time limits. I think we need to set time limits to arguments. We do need to set time limits to adjournments. Incidentally, in law, there is a provision is you can't get more than X number of adjournments. But all said and done, adjournments are done. Now, for example, just take a separate system. Let's take UK for a moment. You have a trial set in, it happens. It happens in a couple of days and then ultimately dates are fixed. They happen on those days. So we must really stop taking this as a matter of practice, whether as judges, whether as lawyers, to say, I can take time when I want to. And time limitation also, by the way, which you were speaking about, is an essential component. They, they, the provisions are there, accepting and unless we really go into the past to an extent that we can, continuing offenses, for example. That's a different matter. It Ultimately, you can't have a limitation for that. But where you can have a limitation, excepting for serious offenses, heinous offenses, economic offenses, whatever they might be in that category, which we can classify, we really have to put a time stop to it. We can't let the system go on. The witnesses are not available. The evidence is not available. Nothing happens. I personally have seen so many trials and appeals coming out of those happening where nothing is available. So ultimately, even if assuming it's a, it was a good case once upon a time, it's just not going to translate itself. So if you can do that, it is good. However, again, a problem that I will park on the last side to say there are serious offenses which cannot in any manner be put 
uh, in the same fold and said time bound won't happen. What what if there is a scam which they have been several scams in the country? They've been But you can always say there are exceptional circumstances, right? It can be an overall principle and you can say in exceptional circumstances the XYZ happens. No, you're absolutely right. I'm just saying, for example, 2G. I'm just saying for a moment. So you you, you these kind of cases obviously will come on a separate periphery, but having said like that, time limitation, a time for trial to be disposed of, bail to be given on certain eventualities. Again, exceptional circumstances can always be classified and yeah. to even left to the discretion of the court. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Madhavan Pinky Anand. Thank you so much for being with us.